Thank you very much. How's everyone doing after that session just now? Oh man, you guys are from yesterday, man. Well, anyways, um, I know we've got a very tight uh, timing. We've got five awesome uh, panelists uh, for this session. The, the topic is quite a mouthful, but I think to simplify things across, as we had some conversations earlier on, um, the framing would be pretty much setting a baseline so that we're all clear. Where are you going, man? Four oh, okay, amazing okay. panelists. Uh, I thought Belong start then you already like, I'm out of here. Um, so the framing again is so that we're all on the same page with regards to CVC and the various panelists here has different um, uh, views and operating models that they have. So let's start the ball rolling on that front um, with the aspiration uh, that uh, you guys will be able to have better clarity in terms of um, answering the few questions, I guess, as a premise. Uh, if you're a corporation, uh, should you be looking into um, having a CVC uh, element within your organization or not? If you're a startup, what does it mean in terms of uh, dealing with a corporate that has such an arm? Um, and what are the views and what are kind of interactions or expectations that you should be looking at? So without further ado, let me just uh, perhaps start with uh, Sunhi um, to just share briefly um, your framing uh, from your organization's point of view, so that we're going to set the stage as we go around. Um, hi, everyone. I'm from OPTC, a uh, corporate venture arms in Southeast Asia for OPT Group. Um, a little bit quick introduction. OPT yes, is the digital marketing um, agency firm in um, Japan, oh, I mean, public company listed in Japan. Uh, well, we've been doing the um, venture investment in Japan quite a while, but for Southeast Asia, we relatively new, uh, started in three years ago. Uh, so question was, uh, sorry. So basically, um, uh, the company is a core business. Um, uh, how do you view your investments and okay, how does it relate um, to um, so CVC? Yeah, I'm sure uh, the each corporate ventures have a different formations then. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of the type of formations ourselves. Uh, we have, of course, a traditional uh, GPLP formation in Japan, and also a uh, strategic uh, minority investment uh, function also. At the same time, as, um, more of, um, you know, the balance sheets investment. So in each level or regions or stage, uh, we utilize all these functions in different way. All right, cool. Karyo. So, so I, I think it's very hard to answer the question uh, in general terms because it really does depend on um, the kind of company that you're coming from. Uh, All right, so, so this so is in the context of Axiata Digital well, specifically. Uh, yeah, and, and, I, and I, I guess I can talk about Axiata and, and we went through a lot of pain and some of you who were at my presentation this morning will know some of the changes that we had to do to actually create a model that has some chance of success. Um, the, I would say that a lot of the large uh, incumbent traditional companies that had tried uh, starting up a CVC, they are completely fucked up now. They're all gone, right? Um, and, and the returns have been abysmal at best. Um, but then if you have you know, companies like you know, Rakuten, Tencent, some of these great uh, esteemed speakers here, I think there's probably a lot more understanding around the role that the CVC can play uh, to enhance the business that you're coming from. I think there's often a, a, um, a kind of a misguided view around what the CVC is meant to do for the corporation. Right, right. Uh, and that's a little bit why people get frustrated after a while. Uh, board members, shareholders are saying like, you know, why are you playing around with this, this little thing here, right? Cool, cool, perfect. Simon. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Simon. I run Rockwood Ventures. Uh, it was founded uh, about four years ago. It's about a $285 million uh, venture company. For We have offices in, in Singapore and Japan. Um, for us, we really started the venture capital firm as a true blue corporate venture capital firm. Um, our goal points are first and foremost, and to the end, financial gains. Um, and we've invested in about 14 com companies. But what we try to do is, as mentioned before, we don't, as a, when the founder or group of syndicates approach, or corporate uh, venture capital uh, company, one of the biggest issues is, is what is your goal point? Um, and one of the best ways to kind of flatten that kind of dilemma out is our goal points are the same as yours, it's financial. 
And by that way, we've gotten pretty good penetration not, across, not only across Asia, but also the US. Nice. Grace? Hi, this is Grace from Tencent. Um, I work on Tencent's international market partnership, strategy, and investment. I help companies to build business outside of China by working with local partners. In that process, I also bring, in, uh, bring companies into Tencent's ecosystem through investment and partnership. So we invest out of Tencent's balance sheet and we're uh, stage agnostic. Most of the investment we do here has a very strong strategic angles. Um, so basically our goal is to uh, work with local partners and uh, startups to build business together uh, in Asia market. Great. I'm Pravin with IFC. Um, I look at uh, internet investments across Asia and then uh, we look at a few other sectors that I'm building up in Southeast Asia, so healthcare, education, and uh, a little bit on, on the clean tech side. So we aren't exactly a corporate, but corporate-like, I guess, in some sense, which is why I have to on the, on the panel. Um, so our team in particular, in, in some sense, is sort of a, it's a venture arm of IFC. IFC typically works with much larger companies, writes larger checks. We look at earlier stage from an IFC perspective, from a market perspective, really mid to late stage, so Series B and beyond, we invest anywhere from three to 30 million as, as part of a round. Um, what we try and do is we align with the broader organizations. So we, th there is a strategic angle to what we do. So some of the mainstream teams will, will look at healthcare, they'll look at um, uh, kind of uh, education, other areas that we try and uh, invest along and leverage some of the expertise that they have in, uh, within the system. Um, and at the same point, we do look at financial returns as the core motivation, strategic fit as, as the secondary one, and then we have an additional one for impact because as part of the World Bank Group, we look at an impact that comes with any of the investments that, that we make. Nice, so that sets a kind of a baseline in terms of the variety uh, type of approach that each organization takes. Some are, as Simon puts it, pure financial, then I'll figure out a way on how to link that back strategically. Um, Tencent has a strategic approach a little bit on things, similar to IFC, uh, and I think also with Axeta uh, uh, Digital too. But what was also uh, uh, important, what I was saying is, Managing expectations in terms of um, what are you there for, right? Because otherwise, it's going to get pretty screwed up uh, as you move along the process uh, across. Now, um, I want to make this panel session a bit more interactive. So at any point in time, anyone feels that's a compelling question, um, raise the hand, get the organizers to pass you your mic, and just shout out if you can't, if you, I don't see you or anything like that, OK? That keeps it a bit more um, and more in context to what you want out of this particular uh, session uh, itself. Um, so coming again, <clears throat> moving on from where we had uh, just now, and uh, I, I guess for the audience over here, those that's coming from the corporate end, that's possibly considering whether should I also move along the path of where these panelists uh, organizations are coming from. Um, the question would be, should I or should not, right? Um, I guess if anyone uh, from the panel um, could share in terms of, um, uh, or any advice in terms of their thought process. You know, if they're a company in a particular sector, should they even consider um, setting up uh, a CVC? Anyone? Yeah, well, setting up, whether it's a division, an arm, but, you know, operationalizing it as such. Maybe sure, I'll, sure. I'll start. Um, um, I guess first, first up, I should probably explain, and, and for those of you who were at my presentation this morning, uh, Axiata Digital is not a corporate venture, uh, corporate venturing unit. Uh, there is some corporate venturing activity that we do, but we're a venture builder in the sense that if, if you looked at the portfolio that I showed this morning, uh, out of the 32 companies that we have, uh, plus the 13 investees, 20 of them were internally incubated, uh, another six were incubated with a joint venture partner. So we're a venture builder. Uh, having said that, there is a, 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 a CVC arm, if you like. Um, when we started that component, um, and, and by the way, I want to separate Adif, uh, because uh, Adif is our digital innovation fund, and, and the history behind that was slightly different. But when we started thinking about whether we wanted to do uh, corporate venturing, i.e. kind of taking out uh, stakes in certain companies, um, we went through, if you like, uh, sort of the classic thoughts around whether we do it in-house, uh, whether we you know, work with some of the larger VCs, perhaps have, have a sidecar fund with them, 
uh, or uh, whether we're actually going to keep it a little bit outside, but you know, hire a bunch of GPs uh, and let them manage that for you. Um, we we kind of went back to sort of well, why are we trying to do this, right? And and the core of what we we're trying to do was really to try to uh, expose the assets that a telco would have uh, and leverage those assets to kind of create uh, new sustainable, valuable companies. Uh, number one and number two is to kind of build uh, uh, assets that that can inject. Uh, synergies back into the core business as well. Because it was so intricately linked to what we were trying to do, we then went with a model that was relatively in-sourced, right? So we actually do have a corporate development team. Uh, they look at deals all the time. Um, and one of the things that we then do is if there's something that we will, we will bring on board, uh, across the street from me, uh, um, in my old role actually, the G group chief group chief strategy and marketing officer. Uh, he has something called the product management council. I will bring him stuff that he will then push through into the rest of the organization. Now, we, we don't push through a lot of things uh, because you know the operating companies can only take so much, uh, but there is a core set of, of, of products and services that when we have invested in, uh, they have, if you like, kind of an obligation to kind of take it through, right? So that's a little bit the model that worked for us. I wouldn't say that it will be a model that works necessarily for everyone, yeah. Cool. Anyone else wants to add? I'm uh, quite sure Simon would have uh, thoughts on that, yeah. I'll <laughs> try to not to swear in the middle of the talk. Nobody laughs, okay. Just, um, so what, what I'm trying to, like, I think one of the things is that when you're looking at corporate venture capital, um, let's excise the corporate out and look at venture capital. It is ex an extremely volatile and one of the most uh, risky asset class. Right? If venture capital was stable, it would be called mutual capital or ETF capital or something like that. And in that perspective, the corporation has to understand what their overall risk appetite is for capital injection and liquidity injection. At the same time, if they're trying to look at, do I want to set up a CVC, the actual why has to be very, very definitive. For Rockwood Adventure, when it was set up, it was retooled to be specifically for financial gains, and that's all of it. If I do not bring financial gains, I am out of a job. This, I am not double-heading any role. Venture capital is my job, and that's the end of me. And in that perspective, if you really want to do CBC as a financial gaining role, it has to be a very committed and the right human resource that takes a hold of it. Now, in that perspective, I think the early, the, the startup B or like the, the, the Gen 2, the lines of the world, the, the Facebooks of the world have been much more uh, adherent and open to that risk taking. But at the same time, if you're uh, an older corporation, say a real estate corporation or some kind of fintech corporation uh, in Southeast Asia, you'll probably have to think about what kind of, as mentioned before, risk I want to take. And based on that risk, it may be actually better for you to not look at venture capital as an asset, but more of looking at how would I participate in the private equity sector or more of the public market sector of equity. Cool. Um, so let me just take that point also and moving, moving forward a little bit. Um, so yesterday, even my session, I spoke about how corporations um, could actually be leveraging on startups and entrepreneurs to actually help them transform, help them innovate uh, moving forward, essentially, because organizations tend to be sluggish in trying to come up with new things, right? So if they are trying to make sure that they catch up with what is possibly catching up with them, um, uh, would that be a, a good intent and strategy uh, for an organization uh, to look into things? Or um, should we fall you know, more closer to where you're coming from? Like, you know, focus on the financial side and then link it to strategy because then it will be sustainable moving forward. I mean, I think it's really contingent on what the company's direction is. What you just talked about, about catching, uh, another competitor catching up to you, a smaller competitor, that is more cogent to what we talk about as a strategic investment, you know? And I, I think a lot of the players in the US have done a lot of great strategic investment, especially for FinTech. You will be really surprised how smart the more older and more traditional FinTech players are compared to the newer FinTech companies out in the US. You can see the newer FinTech companies who have actually gone, been able to become public really beating the crap out of themselves because they can't compete with what's going on with the older investment banking community and whatnot. So really, the alignment and the philosophical id has to be there in terms of whether or not if it's a catch-up, you'll take the risk appetite with it, then you take the strategic angle with it, or if it's a completely new business, then what is the actual goal point of that investment and liquidity and risk-taking? Anyone else has any thoughts on that? Grace? Yeah, so I think from our perspective, um, we look at startups, you know, when we invest in them, I think you know, that help us to get access to new technologies. 
or uh, new business models or even bring us to new market. Um, so I think that's, that's a strategic angle we can see. And sometimes uh, we can leverage what we have in China, the resources Tencent have, the knowledge the knowledge that we have in certain verticals to help that startup to grow. So it's more of like a mutually benefit relationship, um, you know, again, from strategic angle, not necessarily the financial. Of course, there always have to be a balance. Um, you want to say something, yeah? So just actually maybe a, a question for some of the, the, the more focused corporate. So with some of those kind of end goals here, is an investment actually necessary? So couldn't you structure this more as a partnership where you work with these companies and you don't necessarily have to invest and have the pain of, you know, whether it's compliance, but also monitoring and all of that. I'm curious to, to hear thoughts. So we're actually pretty open, you know, we do, we can do investment, joint ventures, acquisitions, or even just a commercial partnership. Depends on, you know, the situation um, of the company and the stage of development, also the market. In, in, J Japan, in Japanese corporations, it's an interesting cultural aspect where if you look at, if you're, if you're saying I'm doing a partnership with company X, that actually bakes in the idea of strategic investment from the very start. It's a very cultural thing that, that works out there. Yeah. Kind of similar to how ja uh, Korean corporations work out, but more works on a heavily uh, preferred basis. But, but again, you're, you're correct that partnerships should be worked out and the least amount of opportunity cost should be taken when executing these strategic initiatives. Sometimes we start with a partnership and that will lead to an investment later on. Well, I guess that the thing is, you know, as, as the encouragement for more new startups, new entrepreneurs comes into the ecosystem stream, right? <clears throat> In order for them to be sustainable and viable, um, there needs to be players whose incumbents or even in the space or uh, uh, that's complementary in whatever way that may be to ensure that uh, both could actually be leveraging on each other. Um, and that dynamics, if it happens and matures well enough and all organizations are able to appreciate that fundamental as opposed to just, uh, you see, if you notice the, the profile of the companies that the panelists are representing, Rakuten came from an e-commerce uh, 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 background. Tencent, very digital uh, centric. IFC, yes, uh, World Bank uh, related, but you got a particular goal that you're trying to achieve within uh, uh, that space or so. Axiara, Telco, coming into a digital uh, space per se. Um, and, and with Opsi, um, it's a strategic approach coming from whatever business that you're doing in Japan and looking at within the Southeast Asia region. But uh, if we stretch our boundaries a little bit, right, what about other sectors? What about sectors that's not coming from traditionally where everyone is talking about over here? You know, are, are the similar strategies for those kind of companies? Um, uh, should they be looking into the same line? What if you're a property developer? What if you are in um, a fashion business? Should you be crafting out new ways um, in, in, in to, in to either corporate ventures or putting in money into things that would then fuel new type of innovations that help those kind of industries and sectors uh, catapult further? Thoughts and opinions on that? I guess it goes back to my question a little bit on just the ability for and what the end goal is and the resources available. Because again, this can become a big distraction. Um, so right. within a corporate, if they want to get into other areas, you know, to me, necessarily investing may not be the right approach. I think the partnership leading to investment, I think that's great, and then which could then lead to an acquisition longer term. Um, but so it seems, you know, there's been a trend of every corporate setting up a little bit, you know, and that goes across industries, beyond tech, food and everything else, and they've got the little arms that they're playing around with. And I think that that's interesting, and if you have the manpower to do that, great, but otherwise, I don't think it's completely necessary in, in, in my view. Anyone else? So maybe this might answer your question a little bit. Um, uh, we obviously, as Axiara Digital, we, we deal a lot with uh, VCs out in the Valley, in Europe, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, w one of our partners in, uh, in the Valley said, you know, one of the things that look out for is when the corporate venture capital guys show up. Because once they show up, uh, it's time to get out. Right? It's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's true, right? Because, you know, you, you now have uh, stupid money coming in, right? I mean, apologies for the, uh, the facetious comment here, but it's, it's generally true that when, when VCs kind of see the CVCs guys show up, all right, then they, they go, well, okay, well, this is time for us to get out. And usually they'll find the CVC guys uh, uh, being a nice exit path for them, right? right. Um, 
what, what I find very really interesting with a company, it's like a company like uh, Rakuten Ventures is, uh, and, and I think we're all saying the same thing here, right? It's, it's a little bit kind of what the objective is. What is our goal? Uh, with Rakuten Ventures, it's interesting that this is all financial return. I, I think this is actually quite privileged in, the, in that sense, right? Because sometimes um, uh, companies, large corporations, and, and I don't know enough about property development, I don't know enough about fashion industry to kind of be able to comment, but, but I would imagine that most of their shareholders, most of, the, of their boards will say, hey, look, you know, w we want to kind of get in, in, in you know, a, a sense of what the technology is going to be like going forward, uh, but at the same time, we don't want it to burn a lot of money, we want some financial return of it. Those are conflicting agendas, right? And, and it's very hard to kind of for you to achieve both goals. Uh, if you are investing in technology, well, chances are that some of these technologies may not go anywhere and you will burn the 20, 30, 50, 50 million dollar check that you've just written. Uh, but if you are then kind of ready to sort of say, hey, look, you know, I just want it for uh, the technology, I don't care about the return, uh, then there's also the challenge that actually, you know what, you might not be able Will take the technology and inject it back into the in, into the existing business because the guys who are in the existing business and maybe property is one of them. You've got people who've been there for like 20, 25 years doing the same thing, right? And so it's actually a very, very tough gig to be able to pull off, right? Um, Sunny, I'm not really sure I'm answering the question directly, but the way we think about the strategic investment, uh, it's always hard, to be honest. Uh, it's a lot of reason. Of course, it's really, CBC scene is very competitive in the market, first of all, that's true. Um, but at the same time, we always have a internal difficulty as well. Uh, the more corporate bigger in, well, I guess it's before, uh, the more um, the functions are fragmental than the vertical. So uh, it's not like a, you know we invested in the outside of the startup so we don't have a team or we don't have idea, we do. But uh, uh, at the same time, the speed is <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of reason. Uh, but um, the point is uh, internal, uh, you know, uh, the entrepreneur per se, uh, is always uh, trying to grab the maximize the resource and the assets of the company as well. So it's not like a, uh, we, you know, um, the corporate the ventures uh, assets is available for you know uh, naturally to the start all the startups. <coughs> so that's why, of course, where the corporate venture capital to step in and support, uh, you know, uh, clear uh, the idea the what kind of asset the resources the founders want, and it develops the uh, you know the action plans. Great, great. So let me try to remove. Um, the label CVC within our conversation, right? Because um, I think that stifles a little bit in terms of how we frame things also. If we remove that, and then even within looking back at the topic, and just focus now the next level of conversation into the benefits that can generate corporations and startups in terms of that collaborative component. Um, uh, do you guys see this happening a lot more? Regardless of the mode of entering, whether through a venture approach, partnership approach, and whatever that may be, let's put that aside, right? Let's kind of zoom in in terms of can corporations and startups really work strategically to achieve mutual benefits? Mutual benefits. I mean, uh, uh, sorry. Um, as a digital marketing firm, uh, can we Coming from uh, historically, OPT invested in uh, media company or marketing solution company in Japan uh, to have uh, exclusive or strong, you know, agent partnership. That's really easy to make sense to us. Then it's really, you know, good outcome. Uh, that's really easy ways to format it. It's uh, strategic, you know, um, based on transaction flow, but. Extend it to the you know those are transaction flows to format the um, win-win relationship again. It, it's it's I think it's tough, uh, but still uh, you know that's why we're here to support them. Right. So let me try and give an example of what I've seen in terms of how. Uh, so I've got a uh, I, I've seen a company that pretty much curates um, ten startups from around the globe. Um, they've got a competitive landscape. Um, products are pretty much similar as they go and approach their client. 
Um, and what they've done is pretty much in curating those 10 startups around the globe, uh, they were very clear in terms of um, the requirements. They've got to have launched in their market. They've got to have working capital for six to 12 months. And then what corporations does is actually, or this company does, is facilitate them in, in upselling them to their existing clients globally. Now, um, the value add that this company has is that because the product suite in other normal circumstances is the same between your company and my company, and when I get the 10 startups that may not be visible from a solutioning point of view to my client, I have positioned myself in a competitive advantage position compared to my competitor, right? And that's what I meant by, could this kind of thinking be scaled across sectors, across organizations? Because not many organizations are thinking so much along those lines. And, you know, like I said, why I wanted to separate between the CVC element of it is to kind of shift focus because otherwise we will, I mean, financial gains, straightforward, right? I go in, I see good revenue, good forecasting, um, good potential, I put money in. Um, and to sell to board members or management committees is also an easy sell, relatively. But when you start selling to organizations, right, that we need to work with startups because it's going to bring value to us um, and to what you're saying just now. Sometimes, um, because it's not so much on, it is, well, bottom line, it has to be a financial gain still, but it's a strategic call compared to actually uh, otherwise. I, look, it, I think it really comes down to right sizing um, in terms of are, are you the right corporation to work with to that startup? I think one of the better examples of this is in the medium, media business. If you look at, for example, Snapchat and then henceforth Snap's overall path to actually success and growth, if you think about how much Barton Sowell and WPP have actually had involvement in, in that process for them to commit $14 million, $70 million, and now they're going to commit in 2017, I believe, about $170 million into the actual media spend of Snapchat, I think that is a very, very uh, you know, uh, productive relationship where WPP is in the end looking for advertising space that is unique and has, holds a very interesting value proposition, Snapchat can provide that. Hence, there is an equity stake that has been taken by WPP and at the same time, Truffle Pig, which is the, the creative media agency that handles a lot of Snap's overall push for that, has actually been very, very fruitful. So all of these aspects put together, if you want to look at why this worked and the other partnership did not, I think definitely it's about timing and also right-sizing each other and to see where you can walk in the, in the path. And, and again, these are, these are tantamount and parallel to finding the right founder and right investor fit. Cool. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? Or, or Yeah, so I, I guess as I look at this, I mean, it, you know, the, the potential win-win is obviously is, is great, and that's the holy grail, and the reason this is, this is sort of Everybody every, everyone's that, right? chasing yeah. it, right? <laughs> but to us, and we've had a lot of interactions with corporate investors in our portfolios, we, we tend to do a lot both tech and, and non-tech. I think the, the, the ones that are successful early on spend a lot more time understanding some of the details. So when you talk about, you know, being able to sell products through the corporate, you need to get to the next of detail. How is that going to happen? What are the incentives? Will the incentives be the same as if those salespeople were selling their own products as well as the startups? So getting to that granular level, understanding you know, milestones of where you reach, what that means, and then especially, again, if you're linked to an investment, how that all comes together is extremely Im important. Um, valuations tend to be higher with, with corporates. That's not necessarily also a good thing. <laughs> Again, if, if the momentum is then you grow, that's fine. But otherwise, from a future round, you end up shutting out other investors um, because they, they, they see the valuation and say, we're, we're not going to come in. So I think there's a lot more thinking that needs to be done. For, for us, again, and this is going beyond tech, I think tech is relatively easier because it's a more sort of, it's an easier ecosystem to work with. Most tech companies are, have a sp specific way of sort of looking at this and sort of the, the end goals and all of that are clear. When you get outside of that and when you get again into healthcare and, and, and other non-tech areas is where you really need to think a lot through how, how this will, will, will play out. Um, some of the things that we think about is, and in particular, um, this may be the end acquirer, right? So if that's the case and you're letting them in, especially too early in the life cycle of the startup, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? They've got access to 
all the data, the, you know, all the good, the bad, the ugly, all is right there for them to see. That could affect what that exit price may be. Um, also, if you've got one strategic in there, that probably precludes any others coming in, right, in, in many cases, right? So if you've already got your potential acquirer in the company too early, from a value optimization standpoint, as an, another investor, it's not necessarily a good thing. Again, it can go either way. It could be a great value add because you could, if, again, the partnership works out well, the growth of the company could be stellar, and then your exit is great, and all that. But those are very, very small kind of uh, you know probability scenarios, right? So as we think about, it, we spend a lot of time. When I see a corporate coming into our portfolio, it's it's sort of like okay, a pause. This is great, but then we spend a lot of time structuring not only how that partnership would look, but even from an investment standpoint, you know, do they want you know a, a call on the company? Do Other they want, type yeah. of. Uh yeah, just all the different Indirect rights. Indirect deals uh, that comes into the equation, essentially. Correct, but also the rights, as, as in, especially if they're investing, what rights do they have? Would, they'll typically expect similar rights to a financial investor. They probably shouldn't get that, right? So will they have a right of offer if, if the company is being sold? Can you, can you drag them if, if, you know, if, they're not, if they're not adding value and they're a small shareholder, they're not increasing over time? So it's not the easiest thing to, to work through, but again, the benefit, the holy grail is there. Question is, can you, can you actually It's always that, that holy grail, right? That suckers you through. <laughs> Great, you want to say something? Yeah, I want to add on that. I think um, to reach to that win-win situation, both sides need to be very clear of what do they want to get out of it, right? What's their value proposition? What kind of value they can bring into this partnership and set their expectations? For startups, I mean, when you want to approach corporate and get funding from corporations or even have a partnership, be very clear of what is your product, what's your strategic angle uh, for this kind of partnership? How can you fit into that corporate, corporation's <laughs> business map? Uh, and then think about you know, what do you need from corporations at different stage of bu your business development? You know, if you have a technology, you prove that it works and that the business model works, then you need a scale, then maybe a corporation can provide the distributions or user base for you. If you're building this features, you know, you're thinking about maybe I can integrate my features to corporate's existing product, then that may take a very different approach. Nice. Um, we've got about 12 minutes um, more. Um, is there anyone on the floor that would like to ask anything um, to any of our panelists here? Because otherwise, I know this, with this panelist, we can continue on just talking and talking. Ah, great. Um, hello. I am working for a uh, venture investment team in a Korean conglomerate. Uh, it's not a very IT technology or even digital driven com company. So uh, it's easy for us. We started venture investment since 2011. It's easy for us to spend money, but the synergy creation is not that easy for us to generate. So uh, because it's a big group, the people who invest and the people in the core business uh, division, they have maybe different visions like they're always complaining uh, about why you invest in, in this company, spending the money we earned, but no synergy created. So I want to ask it, um, the guests, have you ever met this kind of obstacles and how did you solve that? Awesome question. Free of course, that's guys. kind of repeating what I'm saying. It's always an uh, internal competitive thing. You know, <laughs> we have to fight, uh, how you say, office policy, uh, politics. Office politics? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> Yes, um, uh, it's, <laughs> there is no clear. Upper. This is a very closed <laughs> conversation here, so feel well, free to express whatever Well, we are feel. relatively really small company compared <laughs> to those giants, so it's a less of politics, I would say, so it's more flexible, but I think I would just to ask those giants uh, how to you know, solve those solutions. Again, um, just to give you some context, when Rakuten Venture first started out, it wasn't a venture capital co company. It was actually a strategic investment company. And, and that, because of that, there was a lot of protocols and a lot of red tape that I had to go through. Um, and basically, I had to rip out all the piping and reformat it to become a corporate venture capital firm. In that perspective, then we were able to segregate ourselves from what was happening on the board side uh, of, and the investment committee side. So that segregation was very important to me 
getting to that point was very, very tough and very uh, hard to do, but if you can't do that, there is no sustainability towards a venture business for a corporate corporation. It's very hard to do, unless you're as systematized and as disciplined as, say, a Tencent or an Intel Capital. Um, again, Intel Capital being that they have an Intel Capital, but also they have Intel that invested $700 million in Cloudera, a big, uh, a big data company. But you, you guys have a like, strategic investment function yeah, inside We have a well. separate one, separate yeah. one. Um, but again, they, their mandate is strategic. So if you say you spent all your money and we're not getting that back, um, at least they won't get fired because they're like, oh, it was for, st it was, it was for strategic needs. Yeah, yes. <laughs> We got that strategic that thing going on, That could be a formula, too, you know, yeah. yeah. But, but again, I, I, and, and for me to say this very draconian, in a very draconian fashion, if there is a conflict of interest between what resources have to be invested or not invested, don't do corporate venture capital, just do strategic investment. That is the easiest way to actually gain some kind of understanding of where you are in the marketplace. So usually before even we made investment, uh, our investment arm will align um, with our business divisions internally, you know, to discuss these opportunities to see what kind of, you know, synergies and angles, what sort of resources we can bring in to the startups after the investment. And also the person who made investment is responsible um, to, you know, stay with the company, stay with the startup after the investment, make sure that, you know, this person will help the startup to navigate within Tencent, bring in all the resources we have promised to the startups, and that's kind of the practice we have at Tencent. Take, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So, Didn't see you, uh, that's all. <laughs> Invisible. It's red, it's so bright. <laughs> um, uh, suggestion to you, wield a bat. Wield a very, very big bat, and swing it when people don't play ball. Because uh, that's what we've done. Just putting on our jacket already. <laughs> no, but so, so I mean, I'm, I'm trivializing a little bit, but I, I think it's, it's, it's necessary to uh, put in position the person who's going to run this, someone with a lot of, if, if your organization is very political, someone with a lot of political power, right? Someone who can kind of just mow through and get shit done, right? And if you're going to stand in my way, I'm going to eat you alive. So swing a bat and swing it very hard. There you go. Um, coming from different points, from bats to strategic to getting buy-ins um, to office politics uh, through. Anyone else on the floor? Um, that's a good trigger point uh, there just now. Um, definitely you know, adding on to where we started that conversation over the last um, half hour or so. Yeah. Hi, uh, I am a business owner, and as I'm listening to you, um, I'm, I, I'm very curious to, to know that um, the horror stories that exist uh, that have been written up about venture capitalists or you know, also known as vulture capitalists, um, the fact is that how do you bring value to invest, investment companies and how, firstly, how do you also assess their value itself at the onset uh, before you, you go in and invest. Um, I am very curious to know because valuation seems to drive, I mean, everyone is talking about the motivation is to make money. So from a business builder standpoint, the intent is also to make money but also to build the business. So I'm curious to know your views. How do you value a business, whether you call it the valuation cycle or the valuation formula, I'm curious to know, and how, what, what is it that you put as the intangible valuation of the, strat, the strategic investment views that you, you have of a company? Could you kindly share and shed some light? I don't want to take that per se. Um, my two cents is that it's, it's quite fundamental across the board, and it comes from every different point of view, uh, and the expectation of ROI that's coming out uh, from a particular uh, uh, exercise, but if anyone else wants to uh, address that. I, I guess there's maybe two or three questions that, that you talked about. Um, I'll try to uh, answer uh, how, like, how do you add value and then how do you value the company. 
For the first question, um, in terms of uh, how do you add value, Rocket Adventure specifically invests in verticals that we know and understand. As in, what, what do I know and what am I interested in? And we particularly invest in th things like advertising technology, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, marketplace models, and payment integrations and whatnot. So in that perspective, we un like for me, when I talk to the founder, I understand where the company is going. One of the important parts is that do we see in the same direction where the market will go in the next four or five years. If that's the case, then there, there's a much more higher chance that I'm gonna invest in the company and that I can consistently add value to where the company has been going. At the same time, when you're talking about how do you value the company, um, Rocket Adventure takes a more markedly private equity approach in terms of what's available in the marketplace right now and what is the valuation multiple assigned to the top and bottom line of those companies. And then we tr try to come to some kind of agreeable extent. Anyone else? Uh, perfect. So I guess similar approach from us. I mean, it, again, it's being clear what you want to get out of the, the investment. We may invest in sectors that we know well, in which case the value add is different from investing in sectors that we want to learn, and, and that's why we're investing. If it's ones we know well, we're coming in, and again, we're not exactly corporate, but we have large portfolios in, in, most, uh, in most sectors. So when we're investing in an early stage company, it's really providing access to that portfolio, providing learnings, for us, it's also about, given we focus only on emerging markets, helping companies go across regions. And so, so in, in many cases, in, when we're seeing whether that's within Southeast Asia, we're seeing a lot of trend of India to Africa, so trying to help with, with on the ground over there. From the valuation standpoint, I mean, there's, there's no science to it at the end of the day, right? I mean, you can look at comms, you can look at you know, other things that have happened. Who's to say that those people made rational decisions either? But it really becomes a negotiation of some existing data you have, you run numbers, you look at what the potential growth is, you, uh, what the potential exit is, you look at what uh, an entry multiple or entry value would give you, what type of return you're looking to get, everyone wants a high one, what do you sort of, what range, and then it's really back and forth negotiation with the, with the entrepreneurs. Uh, cool, any members in the audience that's from the corporations, just like uh, the lady in front there just now, um, um, Share some of your thought processes if you're thinking along those lines. Uh, questions, clarifications, um, uh, anything that, that you're thinking about uh, or that's causing you to refrain certain things uh, from happening, essentially. No? Yes. Um, hi, I'm Melissa. I'm from East Ventures. Actually, it's not a corporate VC but I'd like to get some view from yours. What's your view on startup companies that take your check uh, with the expectations of exit opportunities? The, what's the panelist's point of view of startups that take their checks what's with a view that? of as an exit? Like, what do you guys think if founders take uh, money from corporate ventures as, an as an, one of the options for them to exit the company? So I go to Axiata to sell my company so that I can make some money. Yeah, the reason right. why you go to Axiata is you hope that your company, they will buy out your company and you can go out and make another company. Generally, no, because the first question I'll ask is, why are you exiting? I mean, for me, I, I, I don't really care. Uh, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I've made up my mind that I want to invest in the company, that also has the biases that this company has the model that I like, the technology that I like, and the people that I like. Now, if in, in, in some outset, maybe two or three years later, the company matures enough that it becomes sustainable and it can be actually another healthy you know, uh, zero on the balance sheet of, for example, Rakuten uh, Corporate, that's great. But again, this is going back to you know, what a CBC does in, in fundamentals. If you just invest in a very financially viable company as itself, then many, many paths open up to you outside of corporates buying your company. There's many paths to cheap corporate debt to build your company even bigger, or even you know, equitable exits with private equity firms. Tencent, Grace? Well, I think for startups, um, rather thinking about getting checks from somebody and hope, and hope that can lead to an exit, why don't you focus on building a sustainable and scalable business? And once you have that, many doors will open. <laughs> Cool. Harry's like, no, why are you exiting um, uh, entirely? So maybe, maybe we need to elaborate, right? So uh, first up, we're, as, as, a, as a kind of a, an offshoot of a telco, we're not very good at running startups. 
So if the founder is leaving, who the hell is going to run the company, right? And, and so, and, and actually, why is he getting out? I mean, is, is there something that he knows that we don't know, right? Um, I, I, I promised I was going to pick a fight, but I realized that actually, I was going to pick a fight. I, I told Ashran I was going to pick a fight with the panel, but, but uh, I realized that actually one of the panelists is now looking, doing DD on one of my assets, and the other one actually, <laughs> the, the other one has an, an ability to write one billion dollar check, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of keep it a little bit calm. But, but, but I, I think one of the things that I do want to raise, though, is that it, it goes back to the fundamentals of kind of why we're doing this, right? And, and what's interesting about this panel is that actually they're very different views, right? right. Uh, very excited that Rakuten has this perspective, right? I was almost going to kind of just say, hey, you know, so you guys went on this path of a CVC, you failed on the strategic part, and therefore now you're just looking at financial returns, and, and maybe that's why you kind of carved it out to two. I, I think it's challenging, right? You're never going to get that model right if you're trying to do both objectives. Um, I think if you're focused on one, uh, if it's strategic, if it's you're trying to, to, to bring in technology and all that, that's fine. But if you are focused on trying to get financial return at the same time, do the other one, it's doomed to fail. I, I like how, I mean, time is up, but I like how you've ended it, essentially, because that kind of almost sums up almost the various thoughts uh, of the various panelists that we have. Um, the clarity of intent of you guys going into uh, is very important. Um, and the possible separation uh, of that intent. Um, while most people will say, I want to make money and be strategic at the same time, but uh, there's going to be that uh, tension, uh, decision rules that's going to be uh, on opposite ends, essentially, uh, for that. Um, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope that uh, you guys have got some better clarity uh, and doesn't, or, or the conversation doesn't scare you away entirely uh, from uh, you know, moving into the path of investing into uh, your organizations, um, putting into a corporate venture arm, uh, or even um, engaging with startups in trying to pursue your organization goals. So with that, thank you very much again to all the panelists. Please join me to give a round of applause to everyone.